Hello, denizens of the internet. Welcome to Call Me Chato. I've got a really special show today. I'm going to be talking with Mark Asquith. So he has uh, been uh, and well was one of the most important people in pulp culture, pulp, pulp, <laughs> pulp and pop uh, culture. In, in fact, that uh, for someone you've probably never heard of, uh, he is instrumental with uh you know, instigating or initiating uh, prisoners of gravity, which I will, um, which I say, there, there we go. The Ty Templeton uh, artwork, which I love, um, probably possibly the first pop culture show about comics, fantasy, and sci-fi. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree, Mark? It's certainly in North America. I, yeah, in, you know, well, I don't care about Europe. <laughs> Forget about Europe. But so uh, yeah, when I. When we started Prisoners of Gravity in 1989, comics were perceived as being a, a you know, a ghetto literature. I mean, it right. wasn't even considered literature. It was well, just your a parents, despised parents art. Didn't, your parents didn't even want you to read comic books. That was bad, right? Except for my parents, because I started with Tanta and Asterix and all the beautiful European albums. Sure. And I tried to read, when I was six, I tried to read these American comics, and they were horrible. They were they were terrible. They were badly drawn. About? Yeah, they were like terrible. from what? Nin the 1960s? Yeah, 1961, 1962. I've, and I've got I my collection couldn't... here. <laughs> There's my collection. Let's I finally see. found it. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So this is. Uh, uh, Oh, Shatter, which is the very okay. First... That's an early, early uh, comics done by computer. That's an issue, but all that, yeah, that, and and weirdly, so the comics that I was seeing were the really um, not so great. You see, I wish they'd been that, but no, they weren't. Oh, they weren't. Um, no, so uh, they. What ended up happening is I ended up getting a stack of comics from uh that were left up at my cottage right. and i think in retrospect that what happened was that the kids who left them there took all the good ones so they <laughs> took all the marvel comics they took spider-man fantastic four and they left me with the really crappy ones now i should mention that among those crappy ones were things like eclipso uh from dc some, you know, Batman, but really strange uh, Batman where he would go to alien worlds, that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until much later that I began to realize that the two artists that I hated the most in North American comics, Alex Toth and Jack Kirby, <laughs> were in fact absolutely fantastic. But they, oh. but they were coming <laughs> I'm glad at you an didn't, angle. I'm glad you didn't end with that because... I, I think I, the, the comment section on my video <laughs> right. will have been filled with hate, hate comics. So Jack Kirby, I mean, of course, is a legend. But and you you interviewed him in a legendary uh, interview on Pog, which we can talk about also. Back in the day, I don't even, other than Marvel, there weren't a lot of credits. Like if you, you know, you had to be kind of careful about uh, what the stuff was. Because a lot of this stuff, you couldn't really tell who the artist or writer was. And um, and it wasn't really until I started working at the Silver Snail, where I learned about things like the Marvel method and how comics were made by human beings. Because at the age of six or seven, I didn't even realize that human beings made comics. <laughs> like the idea that a person made a comic was a completely foreign idea. I knew people wrote books because my my family writes books and that kind of stuff. But oh, no, you're, comic... you're a smart person. <laughs> oh, we should end this now. No, no, I, I, I just talk to, I don't talk to smart people. No, no, I what? But I'm smarter than I was when I was six. Let me just put it that way. I just had no idea that comics were created. I mean. As I say, it was just such a foreign concept, and, um, and particularly in North American comics, where it, they felt like an assembly line. There wasn't really a sense of anybody doing. Um, I, like well, I I love them. I I remember distinctly that I would read the comics twice. First, I would flip through them as quickly as I could, just looking at the artwork and kind of getting an idea of what was going on. Then I would go back and actual spend actually spend the tedious time <laughs> reading the text. Because that was well, just the way my my brain worked. 
I I could only afford a certain number of comics a month. And of so uh, for, My, I, I got, I think, 25 cents allowance a month. Yeah, absolutely. So that that could buy you two comics. Right. Uh, if you didn't opt for the chocolate bar. And <laughs> so what it meant was and uh, no, I'm serious. What it meant was that you read those comics 10 times. Right. Like I, I uh, what a friend of mine calls the soak. And he goes, you know, you would get that issue of whatever it was, Spider-Man or Fantastic Four, and you would read that comic like 10 well, times. Well, and look, and look, look, look at this. I have my name on this. We we yeah. uh, shared, yeah. we we would write our names, share the comics that we we yeah. got. And then yeah. I, I, think, and, uh, I think I probably, you know, wrecked my comics by putting my name on the Yeah, they, they, but all of that was, you know, and I, I had been taught kind of not to write in books so i didn't do that oh okay. uh, i didn't i wasn't very good at sharing paul <laughs> i wasn't as socially adept as you were so i kept my comics basically and but it I was i would read i would read i just read those comics till they died i mean particularly tantan asterix my sure. tantan volumes look like yeah, i they i i, I have the complete them. series here i've got every single one even the banned ones they're amazing. And one of the things that really pissed me off was that when I started working with Rick Green, he'd actually met Hergé, yeah, which meant yes. that he was going to be my blood enemy forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, you, but then, so you started off reading the things and you had, you know, then I hated with them. I bounced out. I was right. a serious person. I was going to read real books. And in 1968, when I was 12, I really discovered science fiction. I discovered right. Harlan Ellison. I discovered Ursula K. Le Guin, Michael Moorcock, uh, J.G. Ballard, like that explosion of that kind of science fiction. I used to go down uh, to this to Queen Street West and I would go to Bacca, which is where I got yep. my comics. Bacca books. And in 19 that's right. And Bacca was the center of my non-university life. And uh, I just loved it there. And uh, I, across the street opened the Silver Snail in May of 1976 on Queen Street West, yeah. 323 yeah. Queen West. And Baca was unbelievable. And, you know, they did you know that Baca hosted the three major cast members of Star Wars in 1977? Yes. Harrison Ford, Mark yeah. Hamill and Carrie Fisher. And I realized comics are my thing uh, in 19... 19- 80 i had met a guy called frank miller and he never became, heard of him never heard of him <laughs> and well then he had just started um daredevil and wow. i came up to him and i said oh i love your peter parker and i there was a, a a page that had the balloons and i said i you know that that was an amazing moment for me and he was like really i went yeah you're you're trying to ground the stories and what new york feels like and then that began a you know a, a long friendship with Frank, which was kind of wonderful. And then he was my gateway guy because I knew Frank. I knew and and I would call him up and he'd say, "Well, you know, I'm writing uh, issue uh, you know 178, and I'm going to do this." And you got to see that a human being actually made comics, uh, which was really fascinating. I, I think me. you've just made an awful lot of people jealous. <laughs> well, yeah, well. And then because I was working at the Silver Snail, I brought up artists and writers every month. And so I got to meet all these creative people because I really felt I want to show people that human beings make these and and that you can, too. Uh, you know, I, I, I you know, you coming from an, a small publisher, you understood the power of somebody going into Kinko's and going, here's my comic because you could do that. It didn't cost a lot of money to do a black and white folded, you know, stapled comic. Right. And so that's where Yummy Fur, where Chester Brown gets his start. That's where a lot of really interesting comics were happening in Toronto. And they weren't even getting distributed. You couldn't get them. And so when I started working at the Silver Snail, I'm like, OK, I'm going to actually put them in the store um, because I think I should. Um, but, uh, which of course is where I got the reputation for not liking superhero comics, which nothing could be further from the truth. But yeah, you uh, were just and, a and supporter of local comic book 
artists. Of everything. So, and then what happened, of course, is that comics were were not selling particularly well. I would say at the Silver Snail, when I joined the Silver Snail, over seventy percent of the revenue came from back issue comics. And people and were looking. So when for was that? Old, what what year was that? Eighty two. Eighty two. Okay. So people were looking for old issues of the X-Men and the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and Batman, because that stuff had been unbelievably difficult to source because you go to the 7-Eleven or whatever. And if they didn't, you know, if they didn't sell, they would be, you know, basically the covers would get ripped off and then returned. Well, the reason they didn't sell was people like me who had 25 cents a month to spend on it. I'd go to Claire's cigar store, which was in Don Mills, and I, they, they had the comic books at the back. And I would sit down uh, on the floor and just read as many comic books until they stopped me. And then yeah. I would buy the one I could afford. But I read, well, I read tons of comic books just sitting there, you know, because I couldn't afford I, to buy them. What a, one of my favorite things because of my because of Prisoners of Gravity and because of the Silver Snail, I got to meet hundreds of comic book people. And one of my favorite moments on Prisoners of Gravity was that I would ask all of the comic book creators. The very first or second question was, how would you define a comic book? Which was fun because it would open things up and I could kind of gauge where they were on the spectrum of things. And my favorite answer was was Neil Adams, the great artist Mm. Neil Adams who did Green Lantern, Green Arrow and the X-Men and the Avengers and a ton of stuff. (laughs) He said to me, oh, a comic is something that costs you a a little bit of your allowance and you you buy it and then you fold it up and stick it in your back pocket and then ride off on your bicycle. And I thought that is the perfect description of the 1950s and 60s comics, which is totally different from now, which is you get your comic and maybe it's the variant edition and you get it in a bag yeah. or the backing board. And that's very foreign to me. I, 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 I agree. I, I, to me, uh, you know, I'm glad there are people who are still passionate about the comic books. I, I, it's no, no one should lose their passion, but it, it was, I agree more fun when comic books were just comic books and, and not in uh, a collectors in industry. Uh, but it but is what see, it is. But it is what it is. And the Silver Snail would never have been the Silver Snail without the people who are hardcore collectors. So we would get the, you know, there were, uh, way back in the early 80s, comics would come on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And mm. sometimes that would even be messed up before things got regimented and it became Wednesdays. Um, and I remember being part of all those discussions about, you know, well, how do we want to do this? And of course, to save money, you wanted one distribution day and one day where you could say to your customers, hey, the comic is coming in on you know Wednesday, because at the, it's very different. There was no Internet. So people wouldn't know, well, when's the next issue of the X-Men coming out? Right. And they wanted to know that kind of stuff. So I would often, you know, when when I would find out what the comics that were coming out, I would pin them on the on the on the above where the new comic books would go. And I would just say, you know, out this week and then list everything. And then they the comics would come in on the Wednesday. And I that disappeared very quickly because people just got used to the idea. Yeah, the new comics will come in on Wednesday. So the hardcore collectors would come in on the Wednesday because they were afraid stuff would sell out. And because I'm me, they would all tell me what they were passionate about. Not not just what they were buying, which was easy to track, but they would tell you specifically why and what they were buying. And that became gold because they. I remember at one point, uh, DC did this big, huge crisis on Infinite Earth. I don't mm-hmm. know. Do you remember that, Paul? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And... I was talking to a brilliant collector and a really like somebody who was in that high, you know, showed up every Wednesday, spent a ton of money. And I said, wow, you know, this crisis on infinite earth, it's really exciting. And we're selling a a lot of it. It's beautiful. It's well written by Marv Wolfman, beautifully drawn by George Perez. And it's a chance for people to jump on to DC comics. And this was a guy who collected DC comics from the 1950s up as a kid and he turned to me and he said yeah and for me it's a good point to jump off and it never occurred to me that that this might be a moment where collectors would would turn off 
Mm. And so watching that was very careful. Um, the, you know, really, really interesting. And of course, Marvel and DC were in a huge, um, you know, they were the two major publishers at that time in the 80s. And Marvel, which, as I say, the back issues were all Marvel. Uh, that's where the bulk of our sales were. And then very quickly realized that new comics, I could really manip not manipulate, that's the wrong word, but I could gauge what the new comics were very quickly. And I, because everybody was telling me, they would say, oh, I'll buy anything that has Neil Adams art. And they're like, okay, I will bump up my order of anything that has I Neil see. Adams in it. And then, you know, people were discovering Frank Miller, people were discovering Alan Moore, uh, you know, and I would, and because of that, and because I was tracking everything so carefully, I became part of the Marvel Retail Advisory Board because I would say to them, you know, this is what you're doing right. This is what you're doing wrong. And uh, from my point of view, I mean, obviously, there's a ton of other retailers out there. Right. You were and always became, opinionated about that stuff. Well, and it's fascinating. One of my best friends in, in, in that side of things is a guy called Chuck Rosansky. And if I'm at 10 in terms of my interest and what I was doing, he was at a one. Like we literally, I, it was stunning. I, I love my discussions with him because he said there shouldn't be any graphic novels, that everything should be about back issue comics. And I'm like, graphic novels are the way we're going to grow the industry. And he goes, back issue comics. And you've got a people, that's why people come into the store. They want their back issue comics. And I'm like, I, from his point of view, he was right. But I saw as a retailer that the graphic novel, which was largely unheard of, even in the early 80s, you know, but that's where we had to build the market. And, uh, and we weren't doing it. And, and comics were terrible in the 80s because the comics that you just showed me weren't being produced. It was very hard to find a comic for anybody under eight years old. Mm. W where are you going to find Heckle and Jekyll? Where are you going to find the TV tie-in? You know, those things are very I have my, I have the key comics for my favorite Martian. The gold key comics that yeah. did the TV stuff are really important. And the movies. Oh, yeah. And, and that got lost somewhere in the industry. It took a while. I mean, we have them now, obviously. But there was this sort of weird gap in the 80s. What was interesting, too, in the 80s was the number of people who were just getting into computers and then suddenly realizing, right. oh, my God, they're all IT. And, and they had money. They had lots of money. Yep. Fascinating to me is one of the key customers, and not just a customer, but somebody ingrained into the fabric of the Silver Snail was a guy called George Olszewski. And this guy was a, and I'm, people have told me I'm wrong. So part of this is mythology, but he drove a motorcycle around Toronto and he looked like, I mean, he looked like a guy who would drive a hog. And he passionately collected comics. He had a complete Marvel, including Atlas comics. So he had the whole thing. And he was really in, he was a paleontologist. Although somebody told me that I was wrong as some other variation of it, being a dinosaur guy. And he also was a very early, uh, really into comics. And because he, his brain was wired that way, he came up with, well, I have to have a list and I have to know what comics I've got. And those lists became, I don't know if you remember them, the Marvel, the guide to Marvel comics. So what happens at the Silver Snail is that I'm meeting all these people. Right, of course. And at one point, because I came from Coach House, uh, there was a young filmmaker, brilliant documentarian called Ron Mann. So he, he said, I want to do a, a basically a, a Valentine to Marvel comics. And I said, you're the guy who loves Bukowski. You're the guy who loves all this. You need to do a movie about Robert Crumb and the undergrounds. Right. That's what we should do. And then we started talking and he said, wow. And I went, look, here's the thing. I'm going to give you some EC comics. I'm going to give you some undergrounds, but I'm going to give you some modern comics. So I'm going to give you um, Love and Rockets. This is 1984, right. 1985. Right. So I gave him a bunch of comics and he was working on a bunch of stuff and he came back and he went, holy crap, this might be a movie. And I said, well, I think it needs to be about comics as an art form, and you've got to make it now because Will Eisner and Jack Kirby are going to die. Hmm. This is 1985, and they are very old men, and we've got to get to them now. 
So at one point, you know, we were kind of doing things a bit hodgepodgery. And then he turned to me and he said, okay, if we're really serious about this, can you get it down to 12 people that have to be in this documentary? And I said, that's insane. No, it, it doesn't. There's no way that you can do the history of comics with 12, for, with people. 12 people. And he goes, please try, please try, because it'll give us kind of a nucleus we can build the documentary around. Right. So he was teaching me about that kind of storytelling. Anyway, you'll get this because you're a Torontonian. I'm on the 504 streetcar coming home and I'm sitting there and all this stuff is floating around in my head. And I suddenly go, oh, my God, it's four people. <laughs> it's four people. Kirby, Kurtzman, Crum and Eisner. Kirby from, is from super, various. OK, so these are from different genres. I mean, I remember that. Absolutely. The, uh, and, I remember the movie. The, yeah. Yeah. So having those four immediately defines movies that what it's going to be is the an American right. art form. This is a medium and not a genre that you by doing Kurtzman, you get into Mad Magazine, you get right. into satire by doing um, Robert Crumb. You've got the undergrounds. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously you're going to have more than four people in the movie. But this gives you the nucleus of where you can build around. Right. As and opposed course, to doing Stan Lee and making it the Stan Lee show. That's right. And and Stan Lee is in Comic Book Confidential because at right. that point you couldn't have done a movie without Stan Lee and Jack no. Kirby. No. You just it had they had to be in there. Yeah. I got to have dinner with Will Eisner and and the guy who created the the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. I got to have dinner with Robert Crumb. And Linda Barry, who's one of my favorite comic book creators. And what became very apparent to me, too, is that that a lot of stores w weren't even carrying Linda Barry. They weren't carrying Matt Groening's Life in Hell. I mean, this is all before this stuff goes, you know, kablooey. Um, yeah. You know, and I was selling at the Silver Snail maybe, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 copies of Raw magazine for every issue. And when Penguin Pantheon, I, they shipped me uh, Mouse as a graphic novel. Mm. And I thought, well, I'm sell the magazine is selling about, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 copies. Of, you know, so a collection of that stuff, maybe I'll order five. So I got five copies of Mouse in at the Silver Snail. And I took one home to read it. And I missed my stop. I went, this is unbelievable. This yep. is what I've been talking about. And so it was uh, really about defining what a comic book was and what comics could do. And of course, in the 80s, you've got, you know, Mao's blew people's minds. It won the Pulitzer. People were like, yeah. really? And then, of course, Dark Knight and Watchmen were the two other books that in those right. three books, they changed, from my point of view, they changed comics. Yep. Uh, they really did. They inspired creators. People, When people looked at, uh, you know, I don't know. Have you read Watchmen? Oh, yeah. So that's a comic that I probably have read a minimum of 50 times. Mm. And as each issue was coming out, I would read it about 10 times as the issue was coming out. No, I, 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 I read I, it only as the compilation. Yeah, uh, of course, I was I, and I was mocked for the, my love of the Watchmen, which was interesting. And why? Well, I would go to Marvel or I, I would talk to the you know um the head of distribution was carol kalish and the mar editor in chief was jim shooter and none of them read the watchman the way i read it because they were used to comics that didn't that they couldn't see what the watchman was and so jim shooter said to me oh it's a, a slightly better than normal superhero team comic and i'm like you you don't know you haven't no. seen underneath what's going on the same thing with Dark Knight. I ordered a huge number of Dark Knights, so many that the owner of the Silver Snail fired me and said, you know, you're putting your friendship with Frank Miller over the store. And I went, no, no, I'm going to sell these many copies. And oh, he said, yeah. you're, you are you have just ordered two thirds of the of watch of, of sorry, Dark Knight in Canada. One store had two thirds of the uh, order. And, and he and said, how, that's how did like, it do? How did it do? It sold out in three weeks. It did just fine. The other, actually, the, one of the other weird ones was a very obscure, uh, unknown creators, very obscure publisher. 
came out with a graphic novel called Violent Cases. And right. I have to tell you, I loved that graphic novel. And I ordered 50 copies because I had the, at that point, people knew me. And so they would give me Xerox. Right. So I knew that Dark Knight was going to be great because I had been given a 48 page black and white Xerox by Frank of what that comic was. It wasn't colored by Lynn Varley yet. And I didn't know what the cover was going to be. Did you but still I read have the it? story? Do you still have it? I don't know. I, I will have to check my files. I'm guessing not. Um, I, I know that sounds terrible, yes, but I'm, I'm guessing that I don't own it anymore. I think I just frankly threw it out once the comic came out. Then I, and, uh, but I, I know, I know it's terrible. <laughs> I, I do have the Xerox of uh, one of the Watchmen's okay. and I have, you know, things like that. But I, I, I didn't, I mean, if I kept all that stuff, I would be drowning. But Violent Cases, it was interesting some years later, uh, when Neil Gaiman was in Toronto and he was doing, uh, and uh, we were, I was interviewing him for Anansi Boys. Uh, one of the questions from the audience was, well, how did he know me? And he said, well, okay, Mark doesn't know this story, but I'm going to tell you. So I, Mark, I did a comic called Violent Cases with Dave McKean. Mark was friends with Dave McKean. And so we ordered 50 copies of of this comic, of this graphic novel. And then he reordered 50, and then he reordered 50 more. What Mark doesn't know is that he sold more copies of violent cases than all the other stores in North America combined, because the two distributors were um, Capital City and Andromeda, and they ordered 50 each. Right. And Neil thought I was a distributor and he, he, he couldn't believe it. And Dave was like, no, no, he's just he's a one store. And that was mind blowing to Neil. So, so did it get to the point? Store. So did it get to the point where uh, something that you liked, uh, you had enough influence that if you liked it, people would buy it? Yeah. You, you had the power. To it was before the whole concept purchase of influencer. <laughs> Well, I, I did the Silver Snail News line, which came out, and I would say, this is what I like. And then at the end of the year, I would always say, these are my favorite graphic novels. And because people from, who were in IT came to the store regularly, mm -hmm. and here's the irony, is that if they knew me, they would talk to me, and I would already have sold them Watchmen or Dark Knight or whatever. But when it came out in the news line, that would get distributed at universities or, you know, people who weren't coming to the store regularly would read it. And I made sure that it was liberally uh, illustrated. And I did everything. I designed it. I wrote it. I mm -hmm. picked the images. I did the whole thing. And it was a labor of love. I wasn't getting paid for that. Uh, it was just I felt comics weren't getting the respect that they deserved. And, for instance, coming reading um, Swamp Thing and realizing – we're selling 10 copies a month of the best comic around. So I would over I would over order it because my feeling was, well, I'm going to be passionate about it. And at right. some point there will be a tipping point. And, well, and that term hadn't existed yet because Malcolm Gladwell, <laughs> I hadn't met Malcolm Gladwell or read his book yet, but I knew in instinctively there were moments in popular culture where something went from, you know, the Rolling Stones in Hamburg to the Rolling Stones you know, on Ed Sullivan. I do find Americans think it's really funny because they're like, oh, well, how do you know so-and-so? And I'm like, well, we played ball hockey together. <laughs> well, how do you play no Keanu Reeves? Played ball hockey together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, there's no way that can be true. Yeah, we all play ball hockey. And for, for decades, we played every every week, we would go down, but no matter yeah. what the weather was, we would play road hockey. So, you know what? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want... I want to limit these videos to okay. reasonable amounts of time. I, I would say that what we've given my audience a taste, I, I think gonna, I want to end this now. I, I want to do another bunch with you. If you don't oh. mind, I want to cover oh, no. off the, you know, the business of comic books, which I, you know, an awful lot about and is really interesting to talk to you with. And also prisoners of gravity, which, uh, was the precursor really to G4, 
you know, people remember G4 on cable very fondly, but really Prisoners of Gravity was the very first pop culture show that covered comic books, science fiction, fantasy, and, and you have on tape uh, the most famous, most, uh, you know, the seminal, uh, uh, you know, people from that industry. So that that's a video all on its own. Now, I already covered it with uh, talking about Rick with Rick Green because yeah. he hosted the show. And I'll link that video in the description below. But let's let's finish things off. Is there one final thing you want to talk about uh, that you remember fondly? And we'll leave it at that. And then we'll come back and do another bunch of interviews with you because we could probably well, do fine. I, I was just going to say the the really because of my background, uh, partly academic, partly small press stuff, partly silver snail, uh, partly comic book confidential. When I get asked to do or offered to do Prisoners of Gravity, how, what a remarkable gift to basically, we want to build a show around everything that you're passionate about. And from my point of view, I'm going to be able to act as a, um, I'm going to have a soapbox and I can put all my friends, you know, all the people whose work I'm passionate about on my show. So, I get to meet all my childhood heroes. It was mind blowing interviewing. And, and also, you got Green. the the last interview with Jack Kirby. We did uh, the 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 Jack Kirby story. I don't want to do for two reasons. One, it's too long, and two, I've never gotten through it without crying, and right. I will cry. There's full disclaimer. But the when I look back at prisoner, or even at the time, uh, one of the great gifts of my life is that I knew that it was special the moment we started doing it. And the great science fiction trope is that you're reading science fiction, but it's actually really about not the future, but what's going on now. And that was what Prisoners oh, so, of Gravity. So you, you, you can't leave my viewers without telling them what the premise of the opening was. So so Rick wants oh, yes. to, is tired of living on the so, planet Earth and he wants to yeah, leave. So Commander, Commander Rick is a suburban guy and he... Uh, at some point is sickened by all the war and famine and injustice going on in the world. And he basically says, uh, you know what? I'm going to strap a big rocket on the back of my uh, Camaro and I'm going off. And he goes off into space and hits a satellite and is trapped in Earth orbit now. And all he can get are the news channels. And is I mean, that's hell right that's a nightmare for somebody who wanted to leave because they didn't want the news and so what he realizes is that he can hack and reverse engineer and he can talk to the people that really know what's going on and those people are the people who are doing comics and science fiction and some scientists i love the show it was deserving of way more love and attention and it's it's available uh I guess, quote unquote, pirated on YouTube. And that's about the only place that people can find it. And I would encourage well, people to look at Prisoners of Gravity because it's not available. Thank you for that plug. And I, I, Rick and I have talked to TVO from time to time and said, can you, and they, for a while, they were up on the TVO site. And I, I, there is something burning in me where I think oh, the world would like to see this. And I, well, oh, it's, from fantastic. my point of view, from my point of view, can you imagine now going back and watching, for example, one of the very first on-camera interviews that Neil Gaiman did, in I think with issue eight of Sandman had just come out, and I remember asking him, how come the fates are on the cover of issue two? And he said, I can't tell you that because it'll give away the whole arc. And, you, and you're suddenly going, to go back now and to just follow someone like him who is completely unknown right in 1989 1990 or to go back to the interviews that i did with um george r, r. martin and some of these great people and, that and are you no became very good friends with neil didn't you yes so yeah. anyways so and douglas again, adams you douglas you've, adams. you've you've now started like another whole path my i was, I was trying to end this this <laughs> bloody video we'll bring the plane down but that's that's the problem Paul, i'm trying to land this we plane. haven't talked in a long time <laughs> 
let's pick it up again and we'll be able to well we'll uh you know i'll ask my viewers do you do you want to hear more about prisoners of gravity do you want to hear more about the sci-fi channel or, or space do you want to hear more about the the silver snail comic book store and the, the business of comic books so you tell me what you want next and then i'll pick it up with mark and, and he's a very yeah. shy guy and and he has a complete inability to talk about these things, as you could tell in this in this video to date. So uh, don't overhype, Paul. Don't uh, overhype, Mark. Me. You're you're an absolutely wonderful person, and it was a great excuse to reconnect with you. And uh, uh, like uh, till say say bye to everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Everyone. For till next time, denizens. Be seeing you. That's my my trademark prisoners uh, exit. So we'll 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 Great. talk to you later, Mark. Bye everyone. We want information. 